Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Howard Luck. I'm the founder and CEO of Tide Pool. We're really thrilled that you could be here today, and we're also thrilled to be here in the office of Dr. Ann Peters. Um, I'd like to introduce, introduce my colleague, who is uh, Brandon Arbeiter, the VP of Product and Business Development here at Tide Pool. Thank you very much, Howard. You are welcome. It is so wonderful to be here in sunny Los Angeles. And as Howard said, we are so honored to have Dr. Ann Peters with us today. Uh, I wanna go over a quick overview of what we'll be discussing in today's webinar. So first, we're going to meet Dr. Peters and a special guest that she's brought. Dr. Peters is going to walk us through a live data review. This is a real review of real, uh, real data, real diabetes data using type pool software. Uh, throughout today, you can use the live chat feature in YouTube to ask any questions that you might have. And you can also tweet to us uh, and we'll be responding either live or in a segment at the end for questions and answers. And then we'll bookend it at the end of the, today with some new features that we have recently, recently released to Type 4. Again, if you want to tweet at us, you can tweet with hashtag TidepoolQA and we will be gathering your questions and answering them throughout the session. So it is now my great privilege and honor to introduce Dr. Ann Peters. Hello, Ann. Hi, Ann. Hi, guys. How are you? We are great. Thank you for joining us. It looks like you have a special guest. Can you introduce our special guest? All right, my special guest is a dear patient of mine named Michelle, and she is my first, I guess, tide pool pregnancy. And you know that pregnant women with type 1 diabetes are the most motivated people on the planet. And she and I worked through her pregnancy together and ended up with a wonderful baby boy named Lucas, whose picture I believe we have. We're showing on screen now. Adorable. He, was a real example of obviously what really good diabetes control can do. And it was really important to have Tide Pool for both of us, I believe, to communicate. And it led to such a great outcome. And it's how basically I manage all of my patients ever since, because it's been a very useful tool for me to communicate with my patients um, through. Wonderful. And do you want to tell us a little bit about your practice? How long have you been a practicing endocrinologist? No, I'm not telling you how long I've been a practicing endocrinologist. <laughs> tell us about your clinics. We know you have a lot going on. I've been a practicing endocrinologist since I finished my fellowship. But to be specific, I have never done endocrinology. I've only done diabetes. And I do people with type 1 and type 2, but I take basically care of lots and lots of people with type 1 diabetes. And the type 2 patients I get are the more complicated type twos, sort of generally not the metformin-treated simple ones. So a lot of my patients need more intensive monitoring. And I'm a real technology geek because I think it helps me help my patients. And what I really care about is being partners with my patients. So what helps them helps me. And technology, especially as it's evolved, has really allowed me to make a real difference in my patients' lives. And I use technology wherever I can and however I can. I have two practices, one on the west side of Los Angeles, which is in Beverly Hills, where I take care of patients who have access to technology, and I take care of patients in underserved East Los Angeles where patients don't. But even there, I try to do as much management as I can. Um, but a real problem for me is that nobody pays me to look at data. And in fact, looking at data is what I have to do for a living, but when I'm seeing a patient, I both want to look at data in real time, but I also want to look at data in between visits. But that is actually an act of love because the fact that I spend two to four hours at night looking at patient data is unreimbursed time. And that's why Tidepool has been so helpful to me because it takes all the different devices and puts them together in one display. And because I get a dashboard of all my patients. So instead of going through and putting in a username and an ID and blah, 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 I actually just get to click, 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 click on each patient. So when two or three minutes, and because I'm so used to it, I can analyze data and then email a patient back and change the pump settings or change what they do. So Tidepool takes what is a burden for me, which is analyzing data, and at least makes it doable. Um, someday in some dream state, we'll actually be reimbursed for this, but for the moment, it allows me to get back to my patients to help them do better. And 
it's really become something that I almost can't do without. So I say to patients, if you want me to do data analysis, I need you to upload to Tidepool. And you'll learn more about how data goes into Tidepool. It's become easier and easier. Um, but it makes it easier than going to one pump company or another because it's just too slow. And even a minute longer by putting an ID and a user ID and everything else slows me down. And, and anything that slows me down makes me not do it. And I want to get back to people, but I also have to do it efficiently. So for me, this has been a, re, a, a, a way of, of reaching out and connecting with my patients. And it makes all the difference. It's so humbling and such an honor to hear that our software is helping you and helping your practice. So thank you for, for being here today. Um, when did you start using Tidepool? I started using Tidepool, I believe, in 2015 as part of a study called Replace BG, which actually was a wonderful study because it led to the FDA approving the use of the Dexcom as strip replacement because we basically showed that finger sticks were equivalent. Um, to dosing off the Dexcom, but I needed to use it there. It was actually not a fully complete version, but it taught me how to use it and think with it. And then I began using it in my practice and Michelle was my first patient that we really used it fully in. So it basically, I stepped from the research component to using it clinically. So it's been almost two years now. Mm -hmm. How old is Lucas? Eight months. Okay, so we used him, well, it's been a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Incredible, great. Thank you. So I think without further ado, Anne, why don't we just dive into some data? Michelle, is that okay with you? Yeah. Great. Okay, so first of all, I wanna explain how I see a patient. So my patients come in and all they wanna know is their A1C. And all I really wanna know is how they're doing. And I look at things like variability and I look at improvement from the last visit and I look at all these parameters and that's part of how Tidepool is helpful. So ideally a patient's uploaded into Tidepool before they come to see me so I don't have to do it in the office. But let's just assume that's all done because it's here on the screen. And then I actually have a little laptop so that I sit next to a patient just like this because I want them to see the data with me, okay? Because diabetes is a participatory sport, me and the patient. So. I'm usually by now, we've chit-chatted, we've mm -hmm. said, how are things, how's life? And then we may or may not have had the A1C. And people always come in, oh, I'm doing badly, blah, blah, blah. So we're dispensing with all of that first mm -hmm. part and we're looking at data. And so what we go to first is this home screen um, and it's called basics. And it tells me in a nanosecond how well the patient's doing. I'm actually slightly geeky enough that I remember patients from visit to visit, but you could actually have home screens that you could compare. But I just look at this new um, data. And so this is the last two weeks. And I always look at the last two weeks. And what I always look at first is the distribution of the blood sugars. So the first thing I wanna know is, are they having a lot of lows? And that's red and I like simple. So red is simple. So I know that she, is not having any low lows. She's having very few um, blood sugars between 50 and 70. And then she's having 42% in range. And this range is defined broadly 70 to 180 because it's both pre and post prandial. It doesn't differentiate there. Then she's got a lot of highs and a few high highs. So just looking at this, it's okay. <laughs> we know we have work to do. Um, and then I look at blood sugar readings. So she's on a sensor. So she doesn't necessarily have to enter so many blood sugars in here per se that are linked, but I also wanna make sure that she's entering enough blood sugars to have her pump correct, but we'll get to that granular data in a minute. Um, <clears throat> then I look here at her bolus doses and she varies a lot from day to day. And again, I'm gonna look at the data to see why this is happening. And then I look at the insulin to um, the basal to bolus ratio and you can see she's a bit over basalized um, and taking 38% bolus. I know for her that this is meaning that she may not be bolusing quite enough. I look at her total daily dose, which is around 30 units, which is great. If there's an uh, infusion site change, it doesn't do it for Medtronic at the moment, but I can see that on Omnipod. So I look at how often they're changing the infusion sets. And then That's this comes me, by the way. Thanks for yeah. your the, um, Then I look here at how much she's doing in terms of basal events, which means temp basals. 
And when she was pregnant, she was the queen of temp mm -hmm. basils. We were temp basiling all over the place because I try to teach my patients to be an artificial pancreas or at least a hybrid closed loop system, which means you float the basils up and down. So we have a whole algorithm for that. Um, but we don't seem to be doing that lately. Yeah. <laughs> so it may be that we need to do a little work. Now, over here on the far right says device settings. And I tend to look at that later, but that's where I'm going to look at what she's doing But in terms of the device. But I first look at trends. And this trend graph basically shows you or tries to show you where she's high and low. And you can run, there's all sorts of ways to view this. I'm just so used to it that I just look at it like this. And it gives you a sense of if there's a problem area. And if I were to say anything, it's the problem area is when she <laughs> wakes up. And this first phase in here, there's this huge variability mm -hmm. um, that goes from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. You can also look at the individual lines. But... I generally will take, I mean, you know, you're, you're not doing that badly. I never say people are doing badly, by the way. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to really get to sort of hone down on this time here. This gets better. Your nights actually are, more vari mm -hmm. are less variable than they often are. And then you're pulling it down and sort of coming in with an average. It's not bad. It's still all a bit higher than you want. Um, and so I do that. And then what I do is up here, it basically gives you the days of the week. And this also to the left gives you whether you want a week, two weeks, or four weeks. Um, sometimes I do a week if someone says they really got better. So I told Michelle about a week ago that we were doing this. Let's see if it changed anything. I would say not really. So uh, a threat of live appearance did not affect <laughs> blood sugars. Then I always do this. I always look at the difference between weekends and weekdays. Now, Michelle may not have that much different because she's um, a mom and takes care of Lucas, but this is what basically you see if you just click on mm -hmm. days of the uh, weekdays, and then here's going to be weekends, which are here, which are actually different. Mm -hmm. I often see a lot of difference. Um, you're actually higher at, after dinner on weekends. Do you go out on the weekends? Sometimes. <laughs> Interesting. We'll, we'll look at the data. So I go through that to get an overview. And often patients will tell me, you know, this is what's happening here or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then this is the part that I do painfully, neurotically, but I think meaningfully is go through the data on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm so used to looking at this that I, I can see the patterns right away. So I first look at nights and I just want to see if her overnight basal is right. And this is showing me, um, and I have to take off my glasses to look closely. This is basically showing me that at least last night she was great, but that she starts to go up at 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. where she gives a dose of 2.8 units. So my first question is, and people tend to remember most recently, is what happened this morning? What were you doing this morning? Do you remember? Okay, ready to come here. <laughs> okay, so Tara, did, you eat, did you eat breakfast? Uh, I had breakfast. I had eggs and, and coffee. So that's the 2.8 units? Mm -hmm. So you calculated this in your brain as opposed to the No, I put, it in the, I put it in the pump. So you didn't put any carbs in? Well, it's eggs, no carbs for the eggs. Okay, coffee is usually about 15, 10 to 15 grams. I would have given, I, I don't know where you are now, mm -hmm. but um, this probably needed to put in as though the eggs and the coffee were at least 15 grams of carbs. Okay. But it, it, when did you wake up? Mm, five. You woke up at five? This is because of a certain young human. <laughs> yeah. So what did you do between five and here? Because your blood sugar was just going up. Walked around and walked, rocked Lucas and gave him a bath and I took a shower and started getting ready. Okay. So what I'll do now is we'll look at this as a trend because if this happens every morning, we could fix the basal, mm -hmm. but I don't know about trends yet. So we'll look here and so this is yesterday. Mm -hmm. What was yesterday? Yesterday, my in-laws are visiting. So this whole week we've been eating out a lot with them. So it's, it's harder to calculate carbohydrates at restaurants running around doing, going to the beach and Hollywood and all sorts of stuff, the tourist stuff with them. Because 
it seems to me again you went up at night into the morning mm -hmm. and you're actually not doing a bad job of counting carbs because you say it's 45 grams of carbs and you don't really have a postprandial blip right mm -hmm. you're really pretty flat but the corrections aren't working because you're staying so high this is what in the olden days you used to do a temp basil because mm -hmm. that would help bring this down but you're just staying high and flat right which you know could be worse but you're, you're not look at this you, you counted here carbs you did 40 grams and it's flat so you know what i mean yeah. you're not doing badly with the carbs i think what's happening is we're not getting enough correction and or um, basils but this is temp basils this is clearly not enough correction now this is your night again and that's pretty flat and i know that anybody who made this program would say i could mm -hmm. use these arrows up here but i just have my way so forget it this is how i do it that was a bent cannula this here is yeah. a bent cannula. Yeah. So I changed it. theoretically, a patient can actually put notes in here. Michelle just happens to remember, but this mm -hmm. is pump. So here, she overrides a bit. But again, this is a great night. And a go you're doing great with carb counting. You're, you're really <laughs> good at carb counting. We're just not correcting enough. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the one low. So here, we give a little more. All right, we've got to fix, I really think, I mean, look at how flat that is. I mean, you're doing really great. If you went to bed at 140, you'd be 140 all night long. Yeah. So I just think your basils are great. It's just a correction issue, okay? Because that's not a problem. So here you do a temp basil for two hours. Do you remember why? Mm, no. <laughs> okay. What day was that? Saturday? Yeah. It's at 6.30 in the morning. Oh, I don't remember why I did a temp basil. Okay. So um, the, the notes feature of Tidepool really helps in this mm -hmm. just because if notes are put in, then I can understand um, what's happening in terms of the variance. But we just have to get your corrections to be um, mm -hmm. a little bit more accurate because your basils are good. Here... You did just what it said. I mean, if anything, this is a little low, but really not bad. Um, and here you do a suspend, or you do, yeah, you do a suspend here. Friday I hiked too. Okay. That one, so that could. When did you start hiking? Um, nine in the morning. Okay. So what's your protocol for hiking? Usually I like to stay at 180, but it was an easy hike. It was more of like a walk around Culver City, uh, Culver City uh, to Baldwin Overlook. So it wasn't difficult. Okay. And I just went like normal. Except for that you went low and then high. Mm -hmm. Well, I overcorrected. Well, I get that. Yeah. But let's, so let's just talk about strategy. So I would argue that you should give, before you're going to exercise, half of your carb dose. Okay. So did you eat 18 grams of carbs? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I would have put in nine. Sometimes, because you were only 107, I might not have given any bolus for that carb okay. this morning. Okay. Right. And also because you've been somewhat a little low at night, you, you might just give nothing. Mm -hmm. And then what I tell people to do is to walk down the sugar. So I would have given potentially either half a dose or nothing. Um, and then you might have wanted to do a 50% basal mm -hmm. because you were walking. Or if you didn't give any insulin, you can just watch and see what this does. And as it starts to trend down, then reduce the basal. Right. But that's the exercise rule is reduce before and then depending on the exercise, you either in advance reduce the basal or in this case, because it wasn't that intensive a hike, I would potentially just watch for it to start to fall and then reduce the basal. Um, but that's just a rebound. So it's understandable. Do you have any more times in here than you when you exercised? Uh, I mean, I well, I walk, I have a dog. And so I walk with Wilfred for a couple hours every day. For a couple hours? No, like an hour in the morning, an hour at night. You're amazing. <laughs> But that doesn't affect your sugar that much, does mm -hmm. it? Okay. Um, fascinating. Okay. So what I want to do is because I think you need more correction is to show you this as your um, current pattern. And we knew from the original home screen that you're on a more basal than bolus. Mm -hmm. So I want to increase your correction, not your basils. Okay? okay. And I want you to try to work some in terms of the exercise dosing, but we need to reduce these, which means you get more for correction. Um, so in general, 
in terms of clinic, what I would do is note what I would change, and then I would actually change it with her on the pump. So I don't know what I should do now, but this is what I would do. Um, and then I would have her upload again in another week, and we would see if the <clears throat> corrections improved anything, and then we keep going forward. But my assessment here is that her basils are actually pretty good, except for the time when her, mm -hmm. her infusion site bent, that we need to work about exercise, but we need to get some of those corrections to bring her down during the day to you know, get her at a better level. And there are 20,000 ways to do type 1 diabetes management. I have my way. Someone else might have a different interpretation. But regardless, it's a plan forward mm -hmm. to help Michelle do better. And using a bit more in terms of temp basils is also helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Peters, you have a, a question from Twitter uh, asking, uh, meter data is close but not right on top of the, line, the Dexcom line. Is that normal? Completely normal. So are you measuring each time it's in there or you're just putting in a Dexcom reading? Um, when I calibrate, I put in the meter reading, but usually it's Dexcom. So you see, that's a, you don't know. These readings, this is probably a calibration. Mm -hmm. This one's probably, is this a Dexcom? We don't remember. Yeah. But so not all of these, this is a linked. Well, they're not all, some of these are actual Dexcoms and some from the Dexcom and some of these are, are calibration. But you can actually, you know, there is a difference if they're high. Um, sometimes there'll be some variance, but what the replaced BG study showed was that the difference isn't clinically significant. So that There'll be some variance, and other times it'll be spot on, mm -hmm. but that that variance doesn't affect adversely clinical outcomes. So I never worry about occasional off numbers um, because we know that in the whole, they're accurate enough to dose off of. Terrific. Thank you so much. Um, if there's anyone watching the live webinar, if you have any other questions for Dr. Peters or about using Tidepool, please feel free to tweet using the hashtag TidepoolQA, or you can just enter your question in the live chat in the uh, YouTube window. While we're waiting uh, for any questions to come in, um, I have one. Uh, you mentioned putting in notes to help remember. Um, this is not really a question as it is a, a comment. Um, for both Michelle and Dr. Peters, we have a mobile app that you may want to check out. Um, uh, currently called Blip Notes, but it's going to get a new name soon called Tidepool Mobile. And that lets you enter some of those contextual notes and information, such as about to go hiking, or here's what I had for breakfast, or um, had a bent cannula, for example, so to help remember those things. Terrific. Uh, we have a question from uh, Sandra on YouTube. Uh, do you upload the download directly into your EMR at the time of the visit? Uh, Dr. Peters, can you tell us how you work with your EMR? What, besides swearing at it? <laughs> I, my, this, there's, there's not an interface between my EMR and this at the moment. So I can do uh, print screens and I'll I have a Mac that I'm using, so I can easily do screenshots and then print them out and stick them into the EMR. So that works, or I just write down um, the data if, I, if I'm making dose changes. But I just find it the easiest way is to do screenshots and then scan them into the EMR. So the more this can be interfaced with the EMR, the better it will be. I don't hold my breath. We use Cerner, and I don't know where, you know, some version two years ago. So I'm not. Our EMR is not very uh, easy. There you go. So uh, Brandon has just brought up uh, some new slides that show some of the new functionality related to EMR and printing. You want to talk that through, Brandon? Sure. So Dr. Peters showed us the device settings view. So one new button on the device settings view is the print button. And that generates a print-friendly PDF that you can now see in, in your view. Uh, so that's one easy way to, to print the PDF, which you can then attach to the EMR. Another feature that just got released a few days ago is copy as text. So now if you click the copy button, it actually puts on your computer's clipboard all of the text from the current device settings. And then you can paste that wherever you want. So two places we've already heard that people are pasting it. One is into the EHR directly, 
and the other is actually into an email. So if Dr. Peters wants to remotely review data and then say, okay, here are your settings now, let's go ahead and add a new basal rate or change this basal rate, um, that's now much easier to do using this copy as text feature. Oh, now that's good news because I actually currently have a thing in screens and the email and the device settings and I write stuff down on an envelope and no, no, that would be very helpful. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, we also had a question uh, of what devices do we support? Uh, so Brandon here has put up a slide that shows the devices we currently support. Sure. So we support most of the insulin pumps that are out today. We don't yet support the Medtronic 6 series pumps, but we are working on that. We do support the Dexcoms, both the G4 and G5 receivers, as well as folks using Dexcom on their iPhone are able to set up continuous automatic uploading via Tidepool's mobile app. We also support a handful of blood glucose meters, including most or I think all of the Bayer Contour line, uh, a few freestyle light meters, and the OneTouch Vario IQ. We will be adding more meters this summer. When do you add the Libre? The Libre is, um, is one of the meters that we will be adding soon. The real answer to the question is we're currently working on adding six series support. And once we finish with that, then we will start adding more devices and the Libre is high on the list. So uh, can I just say one thing that makes me think of this is that a number of my patients are on the loop system, which is a system that's a artificial varying the basal rate system. And I can see in my patients on the loop system in here, the, all the data. And it's actually amazingly helpful to me because I'm learning how to adjust for all of us using hybrid closed loop type systems is new. And I can see in Tidepool all the variants of the basals and things. I know you can do it with the, the Medtronic software, but it's, it's for non-Medtronic systems. And I'm learning so much about how the system works. So I'm learning how to adjust it. But the loop data in here, as this technology advances actually comes in here beautifully. So I didn't realize that, but now that I have a number of patients on loop, I can begin to see what the artificial systems are doing and, and start trying to, to help adjust it, right? Because I don't, you know, trust anything completely for my patients. I want to be sure that I have some ability to deal with the settings. So I've been liking this with my loop patients. Terrific. Um... We uh, have another question from William Zeller. Hello, William. Thanks for uh, attending. Uh, does Dr. Peters communicate with patients about their management between visits? And if so, how does she do it? I do it on email primarily. So it's I people will send me their tide pool data and I'll email them back. Um, I also unofficially, but probably shouldn't say, text patients because all my patients have my cell phone number and I actually publish my cell phone number on my website because I want patients to have access to me. So if you ask me if I have a life, the answer is no, but <laughs> my patients all have a lot of access to me. But mo you know, for the, for the, what I tell people is that because I'm doing this in my spare time, you know, I basically will batch it together. So I'll have five or six people email me. They'll say I uploaded to blip because I won't know or I uploaded to type. I won't know that they did it. So they actually have to send me an email and then I'll have, and I actually highlight them in green on my, you know, mailbox. And then at the end of the day, I'll sit and I'll go into Typhoon and I'll have five patients and I'll just go da, 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 and then send them emails about what I think their pump setting should be. The ones, the patients that I'm obviously most hyper aware of are the patients with type one diabetes who are pregnant. And we have lots of those at any given time. So those patients I get back to right away. Um, then, you know, new onset patients, new to device, new to technology. There are a lot of places at which I want lots of data to come my way. There are other times when patients are pretty stable and I say, if you want my help, just to upload. But people have to tell me that they've uploaded to Tidepool and then I'll look at it. Terrific. 
Uh, we have another question from uh, Joe Quinn on Twitter. Hey, Joe. Um, this is a, a bit of an engineering question, so I'll take this one. Is the Tidepool server fire enabled, F-H-I-R? Uh, for those that aren't aware, uh, fire is an open standard for transferring uh, medical data through uh, what are known as RESTful APIs. Uh, the short answer is no, Joe. It is not yet fire enabled, but we are huge fans of fire, and we definitely hope that it gets uh, more adoption in uh, other EMR systems. And uh, we have spoken with uh, both the fire team directly and with uh, EMR vendors who are working on fire. And it does seem a very likely direction for us to go, but we haven't gone there yet. But thanks so much for uh, uh, asking about that because we're big fans as well. All right, uh, I think we should probably move on. Michelle and Dr. Peters, thank you so much. Um, we're just going to spend a few minutes now and uh, have Brandon walk through some of the upcoming features, which hopefully you'll be uh, interested in as well. So Brandon, go ahead if you want to talk. Oh, yeah, absolutely, please. So, in case anybody wonders, when I'm seeing a patient, so let's just say that Michelle's life has kind of changed. She's like had a baby or <laughs> in-laws, all these things have changed. But I never try to fix everything that I see in a, in a set of uh, data all at once. And so I try with each patient to make very specific goals. Can you fix around breakfast time and early in the day versus let's fix everything in this? So mm -hmm. people are going to say, well, look at all this. She's high here. She's high there. But that's not the point. The point is, is what can I actionably fix? What can I do that's safe? What can I do that gives her goals and targets? How can I work with her? So. The, the notion of what I do when I look at all of this is pick the thing that you that either is dangerous, like too much hypoglycemia, or I can work on to, um, you know, improve control at this time of day. And then, you know, that will then lead things to be better. So when you all leave watching me as you're about to, I'm going to sit with her and I'm going to change your pump settings and and, you know, really work on focusing on that morning time um, to get things smoother. So then it kind of transfers to later being smoother. But I'm very specific on a specific goal per upload, per evaluation, because again, I can't change everything. And, you know, diabetes is so much a part of people's lives. So that it's like, oh, here, change your life, you know, <laughs> give Lucas away, put him in date, preschool, you know, whatever. He's taking too much time. But you've got to really um, look at that aspect, I think. And it, you know, at least it lets us communicate. And then she can say, next time when she uploads, I think I might have fixed the morning. Now I need help with dinner time, or I don't know. Yeah, it, it helps, I think. Baby steps. Baby steps. Because <laughs> you you can't change people. All, I mean, Michelle knows how to manage her diabetes really well, and right now she's been just a little busy. So <laughs> it, we're, we're going to work on it. <laughs> Well, we're so honored uh, to be here with you, Michelle. Thank you so much for being willing to sit with Dr. Peters and with us and share your data and share your story. Uh, and Dr. Peters, thank you so much for showing us how that you dive in and, and look at data with people. So we're going to transition now and just spend a few more minutes talking about some of the new features available in Tidepool. And so Brandon, if you want to go ahead and walk through those. Sure thing. Dr. Peters and Michelle, can I actually ask you, would you mind, you, you're welcome to, to start doing pump settings. If we Can you hang on just uh, uh, for a few minutes so if we get um, any more questions coming through, we can we can forward them over to you. Quietly sit here and, and fix a few things. Don't That's let it bother you. Great. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about a few new features in Tidepool. So one that Dr. Peters mentioned is infusion site changes. So one of the things that we're very sensitive to at Tidepool is that everybody's diabetes is a little bit different. Uh, one way that that manifests is that people have different habits around changing their infusion sites. Some people, for instance, change their entire tube every time they change the site. Other people actually change the site and keep the reservoir and the tubing the same. So the impact of that is that the way that the data generates infusion site changes is a little different. So one thing that we've recently released is the ability for you or for your patients to customize what does an infusion site mean to you? Does it mean that you filled your cannula or does it mean you filled your tubing? Now with an Omnipod, there is no cannula or tubing. Well, I guess there's a cannula, but there's no tubing. So that just goes by default. This now works 
for tandem pumps, animus pumps, and omnipod pumps, and it will start working for Medtronic pumps soon. Before you dive into the next one, uh, Dr. Peters and Michelle, if you're still there, we do have one more question for you uh, from Sandra on YouTube. How much time does it take for patients to upload devices at home? Uh, do they have difficulties, uh, for example, not having all the cords? So this is a question for Michelle. Uh, it only takes a few minutes, um, depending on how long it's been since you last uploaded. If I go like a month without uploading, it'll take a little bit longer. But uh, I don't even think I have the cord for my Dexcom, like the original cord for my Dexcom that I got with it. It's just a micro USB cord that I have that I plug in, that I plug into. And then I use the CareLink, um, uh, the Contour Next uh, meter. And so then that's how I, I upload to CareLink and then upload from CareLink to Terrific. So there's a beginning to this. So a lot of my patients who, who haven't been in my practice for a while aren't used to uploading and they, they've lost all the pieces. And so there's a piece acquisition phase. But I, I mean, again, I'm offering to be a resource and I want people to upload. And if you look at data, a lot of patients don't upload. And I think part of it's that maybe they don't have somebody who wants to look at it, but I want people to upload. And an example that obviously I can't show you at the moment are people who who actually upload and then self-analyze. So I have patients who look at the tide pool basic screen and they will then adjust their own basal rates, they'll adjust their corrections. They'll email me and say, Ann, I think I need to do X, Y, and Z. But I really want to empower patients to see their own patterns. And I think tide pool is really good for that. And so I, I work on um, with people to try to, to do their own self-evaluation so they don't just have to rely on me. But I have people who've really done things that have really impacted their profiles on their own. So I'm pretty impressed by how patients themselves can use this. Mm -hmm. But there is a phase of getting used to it, and there's a phase of getting the pieces. And so that's, you know, in the beginning, people have a certain resistance, like, oh, my computer doesn't work. I, I've heard every excuse known to man as to why people can't upload. But fundamentally, it's simple. You just have to have a functional computer and the, the the cables or cords that you need, and that's all gettable. But it does take a little bit of upfront preparation. We, uh, on our support site, we have articles that point at all the little doodads that you might need. One of our favorites is a cable you can get from Amazon for, I believe it's six or eight dollars, which has two ends on it, and it works with Omnipod and Tandem and Dexcom and many other devices. So. Yeah, it's worth just pointing out, Tidepool does not require anything special. There's no proprietary Tidepool dongles. It's just your computer, your internet, and whatever cables came with your device. Um, so you can always get new ones from the manufacturer or off and off of Amazon. All right, we're going to dive back into some new, new features in Tidepool. So uh, here is something that we released a few weeks ago where uh, you as a clinician or your patient can actually update the target range. So the default is 70 to 180 milligrams per deciliter, but that's not right in all circumstances. So this is now something that you can customize in the uh, patient profile. We already talked about the updates to device settings with the print view and the new copy to EHR. I also want to mention the Tidepool research platform. So Dr. Peters mentioned earlier that this was actually how she started using Tidepool. And this was a very limited release back in 2015 of the Tidepool research platform, only in use by the Jabe Center for Health Research. Now it's also being used by the T1D Exchange, by Dartmouth, and has been used in more than 30 clinical sites across the country. The Tidepool research platform is now openly available. So if you are a diabetes researcher, and want to use Tidepool's uploading, data storage, data querying, or data visualization tools for your research, go ahead and email us at research at tidepool.org. You can also find out more at tidepool.org slash research. And the last thing that I want to mention is, uh, is just a little carrot at the end of the stick. This is coming soon. This is the new Tidepool mobile app. And what we've done that's different in the new Tidepool mobile app that will be coming soon is we're actually integrating the data visualization from pumps, from CGMs, from blood glucose meters back into the mobile app. So you can add note, add your context, and actually see what happened uh, right there on your mobile phone. And the next time you go out for that same pizza dinner or the same burger, you can see how you bullis last time and how it affected your glucose so that you can make a different or a better decision next time. 
So that about wraps it up for us. I do want to give a big thank you to JDRF. JDRF has been a huge supporter of Tidepool and our mission to make sure that clinics all over the country have access to free software. So again, Tidepool for Clinicians is now available. It is free. You can sign up at tidepool.org. And are there any other questions that have come in? Doesn't look like it. All right, great. Well, again, thank you all so much for joining us. It has really been an honor to have you uh, join us today. Dr. Peters, thank you so much. Michelle, thank you. Again, we really appreciate your time. Um, if you have any feedback for us or want to ask more questions, feel free to send us an email at clinics at tidepool.org, uh, and we'd be happy to answer those questions. Um, we also really want to say thank you to the entire uh, diabetes community. We are so appreciative. I think, as you all know, Tidepool is a nonprofit, and we've gotten incredible support from JDRF, from the Helmsley Charitable Trust, the Goldsmith Foundation, hundreds and hundreds of individual donors, and we really couldn't do it without everyone. We also want to say thank you to our community manager, Chris Snyder, who's been fielding your questions on Twitter and YouTube. Great to have you on the team, Chris, and to the entire Tidepool team. Uh, we like to say we have pancreas in the game uh, of everyone on the Tidepool team. Uh, many of us are living with type 1 diabetes. Uh, I have a daughter with type 1, as do two other folks on the team. So this is a very personal mission for us, and I'm so grateful and thankful to be working with such a dedicated and focused team. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we'll let you know soon about our next webinar. Thank you again, Dr. Peters and Michelle, and we hope everyone has a terrific day. Take care. Mm -hmm.